You're listening to the We Love Equity Real Estate Show, a podcast that discusses the intricacies of real estate investing with your host, Marcus E. Maloney. Marcus is a real estate investor best known for being the equity king. He's been awarded that moniker because he and his team find amazing real estate deals. He will be talking with investors who have done some transformational things in the real estate industry. They'll discuss their process, their strategies, and how their investments transform their lives and the communities they invest in. We welcome you to the We Love Equity Real Estate Show. If I can pay you double digits, and I'm not saying I enjoy that, but if I can do that, get into a deal with none of my own money, pay you out in a year or two, and then keep the asset for the next 20 or 30 years, you know, it's all the win-win. So the investor mindset is just so huge. And that's something I find people get so stuck on. They get like that tunnel vision on. The We Love Equity Show is brought to you by Azria, widely recognized as an outstanding resource for real estate investors with exceptional education, networking, and support, along with profit-enhancing benefits and all aspects of real estate investing. Visit Azria at www.azria.org. That's visit Azria at www.azria.org. Hello, We Love Equity family. How are you guys doing today? We are pleased to have some international investors on with us today, and they're going to share some some great insights on how to raise capital, how to buy and purchase apartment complexes without any syndication or joint ventures. So I want you to strap your seatbelts in get ready. If you're looking to be a passive investor, this episode is exactly what you need. So today we have Melanie and Dave Dupree based out of Canada, and I want to welcome them to the show. So Melanie and Dave, how are you guys doing? Hey, Marcus. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're great. Thank you for having us. All right. Great, great, great. So you guys are pretty much buying apartments and you're doing it with OPM other people's money, but at the same time, they're not locked into your deals long-term. So before we get to that, guys, share with us, how did you get started? What were you doing before real estate investing? Yeah, I used to work at our local college and Dave was a full-time firefighter. And we started buying properties the traditional way using our own money. And of course, we quickly ran out and we knew that if we wanted to create freedom for ourselves and, and our, our children that we had to do something different. And, and uh, then we decided to do a lot of research and we found out about creative financing and owner financing and, and solely owning properties because that's something that was really important to us. And uh, we were able to, that year, we the same year, yeah. bought 12 properties in 12 months. Yeah. Wow. And what was interesting, Marcus, was the big traditional lenders said, you guys don't fit in the box anymore. We're no longer lending to you. So it kind of, at the time, it sucked, but it forced us to, to understand creative financing. So I, I thank them now that they said no back then. There you go. You know, and that's one thing that I tell people. <laughs> sometimes that no will steer you in a direction that you need to go into. You know, a lot of times we hear no and we immediately become negative when we start doubting ourselves. But sometimes, guys, that no will lead you right into the path that you need to go into. So being a firefighter working at the local university and things like that. So you guys wanted to do something different and creative financing was your way out. So ask, answer this question for me. How did you guys get started? Where did you learn about the creative financing from? Yeah, well, we were on a trip to Florida or in Florida with the kids and we listened to Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it completely changed our mindset. So we used to want to be debt free, <laughs> pay off yep. our mortgage, and and that book, although it didn't show us how to do it, it definitely changed our mindset. And and that was the mindset is the most powerful thing, of course, you can have. And that changed our mindset. Once we realized, like, wait a second, if we change the way we think and then and we can find out how to actually do this, it can change our lives. And yeah, that's exactly what happened. Well, and the two things, like the like Mel saying, the mindset is huge, right? The two biggest things with the mindset, Marcus, was. A, understanding debt and that debt doesn't have to be bad, right? Which, nope. which is huge. And we, that could, that's another rabbit hole that we could go down. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing as well is 
no longer, and I was so guilty of this as a firefighter, trying to find every single penny, squeeze out every deal, squeeze out everything, not being a consumer mindset uh, oriented person, but having that investor mindset where I might have to pay money to learn things. I might have to, you know, invest in myself to understand that. But yeah, the investor mindset over consumer was huge as well. So those that, two mindset changes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's very important because I teach a class and one of the things we start out with in the beginning is investor mindset and investor identity. And a lot of people, you know, when you say, okay, well, we're going to talk about mindset immediately. It's like, oh boy, why do we got to learn about the mind and everything like that? But like you said, when you change that mindset and flip it from, you know, what she was to where you are now, the light bulb just goes off and you can see that there's a whole nother realm of possibilities out there. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. With that being said, so you went from having that consumer mindset of, you know, kind of inflow, inflow, let me try and be a tight wad, let me try and squeeze out every <laughs> penny to then it was like, okay, you know what, if this is something that I want to do and something that I need to do for my family, I'm going to need to invest some time, some money, some energy into doing that. Part of that as well, Marcus, was I remember just analyzing so many different financial institutions to see, you know, who would have 0.02 better interest rate. And I would yeah. have flop over to different institutions to save that. And that was the consumer mindset, which again, there's nothing wrong with, but as being an investor now paying, and people ask this all the time, how much interest do you pay on your private money? Well, we've paid zero, we paid three, we paid five, we paid eight, we paid double digits. But as the investor mindset, if I can pay you double digits, and I don't, I'm not saying I enjoy that, but yep. if I can do that, get into a deal with none of my own money, pay you out in a year or two, and then keep the asset for the next 20 or 30 years, you know, it, it's all the win-win. So the investor mindset is just so huge. And that's something I find people get so stuck on. They get like that tunnel vision on interest rates. It has to be the lowest. Purchase price, it has to, I have to win. I have to nickel and dime. Like it's just, and I'm not yep. saying there's anything wrong, but. Sorry, as, uh, you're kind of going on a rant here. As you're talking, <laughs> uh, consumer mindset versus investor mindset, that's one of the biggest thing I find with people is just uh, the, those two things anyway. Sorry. And, and like you said, they just didn't, that, that switch haven't been flipped yet to understand the difference because that was one of the things that I went through, honestly, you know, cause I was using hard money for some of our flips and things like that. And I was like, man, I just don't want to pay all of this money, you know, for, mm -hmm. to get into a deal. But then I was thinking, I was like, but you got into the deal. You know, if I didn't have that hard money, I don't use hard money too much anymore, but at the time it was like, okay, well, if I didn't have the hard money, I wouldn't have been able to get into the deal because I wasn't raising private capital at the time. So, and that's what I'm here to tell everybody is just get into the deal, find a way to get into the deal and you'll be able to run your numbers and work your numbers, you know, once you're into it. Now, let me preface by saying, Make sure you know your numbers on the front end. That way you're not stuck and you will not be able to perform on the back end. So very great topic, Dave. Great for bringing that up. Mel, you got any input there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not afraid of good debt. What's important is to make sure and realize that, yes, it's doable. Yes, you can scale and create that freedom. However, it won't work for every deal mm -hmm. as well. So a uh, big thing that we always told ourselves is that you always have to make sure that you know exactly how you're going to pay back the lender. So edit before you enter the deal. You should yep. know your numbers. The deal has to make sense. So yes, higher interest rates won't make sense for every deal. You really have to crunch your numbers and, and make sure of that as well. And there's so many different ways to do it as well. I mean, we you know, have money lenders, there's owner financing, there's private secured funds. Like there's just so many different ways that you can use these strategies depending on the deal and, and what it can sustain. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm the first one to say, first and foremost, is you want to make sure you have your investors' money secured so they can always get their money back. Your money is always last. So guys, listening to this, if you're going out, you're raising private capital, you're trying to get into some apartment complex, fix and flips, whatever, make sure you're able to get your return solid enough for your investors. Then you can make some, but the, the end goal is Everybody make money, but but first, make sure you can return your, your investors' capital. Okay. Yeah. 
No, are, Marcus, I, I was going to, you stole the words out of my mouth. Like we call it lifting an asset, right? Lifting it in appreciation. And we literally say the lift is for the investor, just like you said, right? I'd rather pay you the lift on the refinance. You get all that money back and I keep the asset. Win, win. Everyone's happy, right? The world goes round and round. There you go. There you go. So tell me, transitioning, how did that transition take place? You know, you guys were working, you know, nine to fives or Dave, in your your case, 48, 72s, whatever. Yeah, we were on the 24-hour shifts. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> So how did, how did, how long did it take you guys to make that shift? Because a lot of people, that's the biggest fear, you know, leaving the secure job, what they think is secure to now go and gamble and bet on yourself. How did you guys get to that point where you say, you know what, now is the time to take that leap? Well, it, it kind of happened unexpectedly. I mean, we bought, so the, the year that we bought 12 properties in 12 months, it was 56 units only mm -hmm. owned. The next year, we were actually on our way to real estate investing conference, and we got in a horrific car crash. It was a highway rollover or SUV wow. and upside down, and it, we we almost died. And, and it was a day that forever changed our lives. Thank ride. goodness we were in a massive suburban. Yeah. <laughs> terrible, terrible crash. Thinking we we're dying, it completely again that mindset completely changed the way we were thinking. And I and I remember being off with a severe concussion and, and thinking about going back to work, and I, I just. Uh, I'd have anxiety about it and I, I was crying mm -hmm. when I yeah. go back and it was awful. But because we had real estate, I was able to, you know, they said, you're not going back. And thank and, goodness. Like, and that's the power. And, and that's why, how I realized like, wow, that's the power of real estate. Because if I didn't have those properties, if we didn't take that, get uncomfortable, right? When, when we got into all those properties, I wouldn't have been able to quit my full-time job, but that gave me the freedom. So, so I quit that year. Yep. And I think um, we kept, Portfolio and you, Dave, shortly shortly after, after, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Once again, you guys turned a negative situation into a positive, into a benefit. And that's one of the things that I always tell people is you always got to have the right perspective. You have to look at, Hey, what can I learn out of this situation? If it's good, if it's bad, or if it's, you know, just even kill, how can I turn this and look at this in the right perspective and Mel you you and Dave absolutely did that you know you guys took a negative and said you know what this is an opportunity for us to really get out here not go back to work and just start focusing in on our investments yeah well it, the whole lemon uh, lemonade out of lemons right like it's, yep. I don't wish a car crash on anyone looking back <sighs> It happened for a reason. It completely, it reset our, reset our lives basically. So anyway, made lemonade out of it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Great. So guys, tell us about your first deal going into it. How did you find it? What was it? How did you secure the financing? Because this is your first deal. Yes. Theory and practice is completely two different things. You can read a book, you can go to seminars, you can learn from mentors, everything like that. But when it's time to put pen the paper and sign that contract, you know, kind of walk us through those steps. How did you guys actually take the leap? Yeah, and, and we'll go through the creative financing one, because again, at first we're kind of doing it the, the more traditional way, but if you want to go ahead and explain our- Yeah, our, our first deal, so our first creative financing deal in 2017, seller financing. So that one approached the seller, right, with our cash flow analysis matrix. It was it was listed off market. So we walked through the asset or through the building with the uh, with the seller. I think it was a seven, six or seven. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Six or seven unit building. And we still own it today, actually, and okay. walked through it and started asking questions. Are you open to creative financing? Are you open to holding a mortgage? You know, that type of thing. And piqued his interest. And then we were able to back it up with some numbers. Here's here's what we're, for, here's oh, what it we're was, suggesting. Oh, yeah, it was interesting because at first we were, we were very excited. We knew as we were talking to him, <laughs> so we're very excited, but we're newbies and Back then, we were driving this old, mini, rusted we mini van. We were keeping bed. our expenses low. Expenses our expenses low. low. We didn't want the finance institutions to have any reason to say no to us. And I remember the seller, said, he kind of was pushing us off a little bit, like, oh, well, I'll get back to you. I'm going on a trip, and we'll get back to you in a couple of weeks. And we're like, I don't understand. I thought we were... I had my ACDC <laughs> t-shirt on and the old van. Oh. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, that was exactly it. Then we decided, oh, my gosh, he's probably judging us because of our... Maybe appears it was, a little uh, bit. What's that book by its cover? Judge it a book. He was judging the book by its cover, <laughs> literally. Yep. 
saw the old man. He saw the ACDC and the flip flops. He's probably thinking, how are these guys going to pay, pay us pay back? Then we walked to the van and it kind of clicked. So yeah, so we so we took our image that we used to analyze all our deals and we showed him our exit strategy on how exactly this is what we're thinking. This is how we're going to numbers. Climbing. It's factual. And then the yeah, and then by the time we left there, we. Uh, you know, we were we were negotiating terms and everything. So and and Marcus, it's funny. He he was blunt. He said he was shifting. I'm going on holidays. I'll call you in three weeks from now. And and we're like, but we're telling you, we want to buy this asset now. So and then once we showed him that, it was funny because he opened up. He said, guys, honestly, he said I had a lady drive up in a what was a Cadillac Escalade or whatever a couple of days ago. She walked through. I was hoping to sell it to her. She never got back to me, and I didn't want to go with you guys because judging a book by its yep, cover but then yep. we when we showed him the numbers and that we had a factual way of paying him back in an exit strategy he kind of laughed it and opened up so uh it's, we learned from that so now there's nothing wrong with acdc t-shirts we just like wearing blazers when we <laughs> when we're asking people for hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah right? yeah, yeah. And, and you know what that that's absolutely true but one thing that that i really want to clarify that you guys didn't do is you didn't although you showed up in the rusted minivan and acdc t-shirt and everything like that you still said hey no matter what my appearance is this is something that i want to do we're going to get out here and we're going to do it no matter what people think of us we got our numbers to back it up exactly and, and we that's no right away yeah and that's what closed the deal was the numbers because you can you can pull up like the lady did in a nice Cadillac Escalade and everything like that. It, yeah, whatever it was, yeah. Cadillac, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and she if, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if she probably didn't come prepared and had her numbers together and everything like that, because he was definitely motivated because he was like, you know what? All right, you show me the numbers. Let's get it done. Yeah, exactly. No, I like that. Yeah, so, like it how changed, you're looking at that. Yeah, so it changed the way, of course, now it's it's a standard. We always have our numbers. We always show them the exit strategy. We, of course, make it a win-win with them. And, and we're able to do more than one deal with, with them as well. And that's the power of, of investing is that once you build that trust, a lot of a lot of owners, for example, have more than one property. So if, if you can show them that, hey, they made money, they made interest, you're able to pay yeah. them back within the timeline that you, that you said you would they'll opt to do business again, or they'll refer well, you to others. And on this one, Marcus, so yeah, we negotiate the seller financing. He held, I think, a uh, 25% second mortgage, which was in turn our down payment, right? And then we had okay. a, a credit union nearby that did the 75% first mortgage. So 100% finance deal, closed it, got the expenses down, got the income up, did a little bit of renovation and repositioning, stabilized the asset and repaid them down the road. But what Mel's getting at, so that, that's the story of that one, but he kind of kept his cards close to his chest. And six months down the road, the payments come in on time. He, yep. We don't bug him. Everything's good. He says, hey, by the way, so when he took, when we, when, sorry, when he sold that asset to us, he took the proceeds from, there's the light. We, we bought an old government building and there's like timered lights everywhere. <laughs> we have our studio lights anyway. But so he took the proceeds of those funds and, and paid off another five plex he had. And six months down the road, he says, hey, by the way, I've got another building. Are you interested in it? And he held 100% financing for us. Wow. So that was 100% finance deal because we had that rapport. We paid on time. We paid early, actually. Everything was good. It was a win-win. So in that scenario, he asked us for a certain interest. He asked us for a certain amount of period of time. Like We worked the, the parameters, making sure that in our cash flow matrix, it made sense. And then we got a second deal in the same year out of the same seller that we didn't even know he had. So it's just... It, because it's a win-win, he came back and wanted to do another deal, which is yeah. so important. Yep. And, and that's that's one of the things that I tell people, don't always try and beat down the seller when you're trying to get a deal. Because you never know, like you said, on the back end, a lot of times they're investors, they may be mom and pop shops, but if they have one, one asset, they probably got another one somewhere else. And if you do proper business with them, the first person they're going to think about is you just like with with Mel and Dave guys? He knew that hey, you know what? I want to offload this other asset. Why not call the people that's already performing with me? So you guys were able to secure twelve units in twelve months. That's amazing. Kudos to you guys. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. So let me let me ask you this. So when making that initial pitch. How nervous were you guys? <laughs> <laughs> very, very nervous. Uh, super nervous, probably literally shaking in our, like literally probably shaking in our boots while in our flip-flops. But uh, yes, 
the, the thing, the only thing that kind of grounded us and kind of brought it back and the fact that we're the two of us it helped out a lot was that we knew the numbers made sense. So we underwrote the deal, underwrote the deal. It made sense. So any objection, we could try and get to it, but I was still nervous asking someone for money. You feel kind of awkward and, and yep. guilty and that you're trying to convince yeah. them. Like it, it's a lot of different emotions in the beginning when you're asking for, for seller financing. And that's something that you just have to do it. Just, just start doing it and it does get easier. Now we have conversations all the time about, about creative financing and loans and all those kind of things because we make it a win-win. It's not a negative transaction. Right. So you shouldn't feel embarrassed. It may not be a good fit for everybody and that's fine, but we don't have any issues uh, bringing it forward. But yeah, it's like, it's like anything else. It's like riding a bike for the first time. The first time you're nervous, you're going to, you're going to wiggle a little bit. And, and yeah, we were certainly wiggling a little bit. During probably, those, uh, negotiations. probably should have put more deodorant on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that but that's the that's the power of repetition you know they they say i forgot how the uh saying goes but it's like practice is the is the something mastery or whatever i'm not the greatest on quoting but it's just the power of the repetitions when you keep having those conversations those conversations become easier and then it don't turn into a sales pitch it's just a conversation okay. um and i'll give you an example i just we just did a deal with a lady here in Phoenix and she put, she, I was in a, I was in a traditional realtor. I had my traditional realtor hat on. She was buying a property and she said, you know what? I'm going to put $200,000 cash down. And immediately I was like, wow, this lady got 200 grand to put down, you know, cash. And then she still had another house to sell. So immediately I was like, okay, she's going to replace that 200, $200,000 cash when she sells the other house, which I'm selling for. So what is she going to do with this money? So we just started having a conversation. I said, you know what? You got this money. You got it sitting in the bank. Mm -hmm. Look at your statement. How much interest are you making on that 200 grand? She said a little bit of nothing. I said, well, you know me, we've been doing business for a long time. We probably need to look at some other strategies in order for you to gain more money on your money. Is that something that you will be interested in? She was like, absolutely. So it wasn't a sales pitch. It wasn't, I need your money for this and for that. But once you become comfortable in having those conversations, it becomes extremely simple and extremely easy. Would you guys agree? 100%. And, and Marcus, I, I think about this. You would have done a disservice if you didn't ask for that because she would have felt more comfortable leaving it in the bank, you know, not doing anything, not take, I shouldn't say a risk, but not doing anything with it, knowing full-heartedly, hey, I probably should invest this somewhere. But the yep. fact that you're asking her kind of, I shouldn't say pushing her out of her envelope, but kind of bringing the conversation up to, to, to fruition and then saying, hey, you want to make money out of this. We've been doing a deal together. I, I see that as a complete win-win. That, that, that's awesome. Good for you and good for them as well, right? Win-win. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's the way she looked at it. And because like you said, I could have been a disservice by saying, well, she got this money is sitting in the bank. I don't feel comfortable, you know, trying to help her make money, but that's the business that we're in. We're in a service industry. Yes. You know, we make money from it, but at the same time, we want our investors to make money because then they'll continue to trust us, continue to lend us money and we can do more deals. Absolutely. Yeah. So let me ask you, let me ask you this. When raising private capital, is there certain laws? So people, so for the people that don't know, is there certain laws or guidelines that we need to buy by in order to have this conversation? And just to be completely transparent, you guys are not lawyers, not attorneys. So <laughs> make sure you do your own diligence. I would, yeah. <laughs> do you your know own what's funny? Go ahead. Mark, if you beat me to it, I was going to say my Canadian lawyer wants me to say that and my U.S. attorney would want me to say disclosure. Yeah, no, disclaimer. I mean, yeah, no, 100%. Yep. And, and we're doing it more in the States. Now, it's funny you say Arizona. I'm looking in Tucson. And there's seller financing deals there, seller financing deals in Texas and in Florida and Arkansas, Detroit, like in Canada. Again, it works everywhere. Yep. But what, what I'm getting at is, funny story is RRSPs in Canada secured funds. It's like a 401k Roth IRA in the States. And we were literally going to be putting. We're not. We're not. We're not licensed for uh, trades or any anything like that, right? Like we don't have. So we were going to put up a billboard saying, you know, put I'm your put your RSPs, which is your four hundred one k, to work with us. <laughs> and I just flipped uh -oh. over to my lawyer and I said, Hey, what do you think? And he went, Oh, we said, Oh no, no, no. Uh oh no, right. Yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. that's that's a funny one that we say. It's looking back now, it's like 
duh, we should have known. But things like that, when when there's secured funds, you, you know, be how do I say it? I, I shouldn't say tippy toe, but you be can't careful. promise. Yes, yeah, you can't promise. Yeah. Be careful how you say it. You can definitely talk about your experience, and then people will say. <laughs> Hey, right. So on social media, we'll talk about that often and, and, and we'll, that's how we would approach it. So we won't necessarily advertise it, but we'll say, Hey, we just purchased this property, this building we're in now. And, and we use secured funds, for example, and we'll go into the details of talking about our experiences as opposed to saying, Hey, <laughs> come with us. We'll give you yeah. guarantees. You know, we can't say that. Yeah. And, and, and that's the right way to do it. Yeah, it, yeah. exactly. Letting people come to you as opposed to trying to sell uh, uh yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, and, and like Mel said, you know, you just advertise what you're doing. Hey, you know what? We just bought this, you know, 12 unit, you know, we used, you know, private capital. We have a group of investors that we work with, yada, 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 so on and so forth. We bought it for X, turned around and disposed it for Y, you know, interesting deal. Absolutely. And then people, people will start coming to you. Hey, you know what? How can I be a part? And that's, that's the conversation. And Mark, it's just like you said on the other, on the last subject, you got to get those reps in. And what I mean by that is now we have people that DM us on Instagram and people will say, well, Mel and Dave, it's easy for you. <sighs> Maybe now, but at, at some point you have to start. When we did the 12 properties in, in 12 months in 2017, we weren't an investor, Mel and Dave. We were Dave and Mel showing people how to do, or showing the, the sellers how we were going to pay them back. You have to get those reps in. And of course, it's going to get easier down the road. Yep. 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 So share with us. So you guys did the, the 12 deals in 12 months. What happened after that? What was the next step? What did you guys do after that? Because <laughs> now, now you're like, Hey, we're succeeding. <laughs> Mel and Dave can do no wrong. Yes. Yeah, so, you know what, what happens with growth is that then you have to catch up. Catch up. <laughs> yep. So when we bought 12 properties in 12 months, we were still self-managing at that point, which of course, and we have three kids as well. So bottleneck right we just couldn't grow anymore we it, it became it started becoming not fun which was yeah. a flag right it, it should be fun you should be loving this on most days there's always going to be days of course but overall and uh, so then we we kind of decided to put the brakes and create systems and create strategies and we hired team members and all of that so so we kind of had a, a pause for a little bit and then and then we kind of did it again then afterwards we bought a hundred and we bought like in 2020 yeah, yeah. So, sorry, yeah, no, go ahead. No, yeah, 2017, massive growth. Then 2018, catch up. We bought a 17 plex and I think a five plex that whole year, which yeah. is still a lot, but con considering the year before 2019, a couple of billion, I think a duplex, maybe 10 units in total, right? Because we're still playing catch up and getting yep. systems. And then 2020, last year, we bought a 119 units. So another growth year, doubled our portfolio. And then this year so far, we still bought buildings, but it's been kind of building up the, the systems. Now that we're playing, now that we're caught up on that, now we're going to go have another expansion in the, in the state. So it, it, yeah. it, it, it's not always just put on the gas. At some, at some point, you, you got to take a, a rest break and kind of figure out what's going on, your right? your systems, what's working, what's not working. And, and that's hard to do as an investor because people love like buying. It. I'm not buying a bunch <laughs> of deals this year. That's a problem. Well, not necessarily, it's, right? It's cyclical. No. You have to get caught up, especially if you buy fairly quickly you got to make sure so so yeah so that's exactly what happened we had a couple and that's the way it goes and and uh adjust and build your team as well of course as the, the more properties you have the larger team you'll need <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, it, and that's the thing with explosive growth you know some people they think well we got to grow we got to grow we got to grow but if you don't have the infrastructure in place like you were saying Mel, the processes and systems you know, that growth can be a detriment to your business and you can lose everything. So yeah. smart, kudos to you guys for thinking strategically like that. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. And, and it's not like, and we're not going to pretend like we're rocket scientists. It's not like it was pre-planned. It was, hey, now we have all these units, but we used to do all those systems broke. So now we got to, right? When you yep. double your Got to fix it. <laughs> what, gets, what, gets yeah. you, what got you here doesn't get you there, whatever that saying yeah, is. Yeah. That, and it, this kind of comes back to the right mindset, right? Knowing that, hey, I'm going to figure it out and there's solutions and I just need to take the time to find that solution. Okay. What's working? What's not working anymore? How do I implement something to make sure this gets done and review it, implement it. And then once it's done and it's working, then you can go back to the growth. Okay, great, great. So you guys, you have the money and this is what I tell a lot of people. The money is out there. The money is not hard to find. What's hard to find 
is the deals. So what are you guys doing creatively, strategically, you know, to find these deals to where they make sense to where you can say, all right, we can deploy capital over here and get into this deal. What are you guys doing to find some of your deals? Yeah, we're, I, we're doing a variety of things. We, we definitely work with investor-focused agents, absolutely. We also do look at off-market deals as well to, to open up the, the number of, of uh, opportunities that we have. And we're also investing everywhere. So we're, we're not limiting ourselves to one specific area, which means that we can really even more bring, have more and more deals in front of us, even social media on our accounts. And so we'll talk about that. Hey, we're looking to buy across Canada. Hey, we're looking to buy across the United States. If you have a, a property, reach out to us and we'll analyze it and reach out if it's a good fit. So just really being open-minded to, to recruiting deals, whichever way we can. It's the power, power of, of talking, right? Power of relationships. You put the information out there and things start to come to you. That's why I tell people, you know, yeah. there is an old saying that my mom and dad used to say was a closed mouth don't get fed. So that means if you're not out there telling people what you're doing, nobody's going to know hey, that Mel and, Mel and Dave are real estate investors and they're looking for deals. But if you're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere and you're letting people know hey you know what we're looking for deals bring us your deals whatever you have we'll analyze it and we'll let you know what we can do with it people will start bringing those deals to you 100 percent. and it's funny people think that well if it's not if it doesn't say it it doesn't exist well i kind of like that that if your mouth isn't open you can't get fed well if you don't ask you can't you don't know so yep. even on realtor.com realtor.ca on zillow loopnet Whenever I'm analyzing deals, just ask, is there any more financing, right? There's no, uh, the worst the agent can say is no, they're not interested. Okay, now I know, next. And there you go. It's, it's so on. Oh. <laughs> 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 we got the horn. And, and if there's no owner financing, it doesn't have to stop there because there's, again, different ways. So if we find an amazing deal and we, we, we analyze it, we, we love the deal, the owner's not willing to hold financing for whatever reason, we're not going to stop there. We're not going to use that no as an excuse. We're going to look at secured funds or private funds and, and make the deal work as well. There you go. There you go. Great job, guys. Great job. So before we, before we take a break and hear a word from our sponsors, this is what I want to ask you guys. So during your due diligence period, what should we be looking for during this period? Outside of capital, outside of financing, what are some of the things that we should be looking for in the property? Or, or if you guys want to talk about financing, just I'll leave it broad. We'll paint with a broad brush. What should we be looking for during this due diligence period? Okay, yeah, and great. Uh, and something I'm just thinking, because people ask us, well, how do you do it in, in different markets where you're not going. So we're closing to, you know, outside of our, outside of our comfort, we typically like multifamily, but we're closing two deals in Detroit, well, this month, in the next couple of weeks. And we haven't gone to the property. So we had to rely heavily on the property management, giving us the, the 360 videos, making sure that the renovations and the rehab is coming up. So do that, obviously, right? Getting the inspections from the professionals, reading the reports, whether it's in your city or whether you're there, you can read a report. And I'm not a construction type guy. So whether I see it, or I don't, I need to, I need to hire the pros to do it, yeah. making sure that the, what, what type of tenant class and in this, in this, in this uh, particular two deals, it's going to be section eight tenants. And I know that the, they have to go through all the, the, the hoops to become section eight tenants. And then the, the asset itself has to go through all the hoops to make sure that it's, it's it meets section eight standards. So again, I know I'm going to have a, a, a good tenant that's going to pay so that I'm doing my due diligence there as well. My tenant class and, and the asset class. I'm making sure the economy, I've looked at everyone thinks, oh, Detroit. And I'm just using this as an example. Yep. Again, we're doing it here. People hear Detroit and they go, oh, aren't they in a turmoil? Well, there's a lot of economic uh, growth going on there. There's a lot of investment going on to, you know, a lot of big corps or companies are, are coming there to try and revitalize it. So looking into that, seeing a forecast for a, a bright future, doing things like that. So there, there's so many and then your typical hiring the right property management company, having your exit strategy. If you got into it using someone else's money, well, it's, yeah, it's all fine and dandy and it's fun buying the asset, but how are you going to exit it? Do the due diligence, double check your numbers to make sure. Yeah. And part of the due diligence doesn't end. So especially if you are investing outside of your area and you're not doing your own property management, you can't just go, here you go, and never do a thing. And uh, yeah, yeah, speaking yeah, from sure. experience, because we were doing, we were self-managing for the longest time. And once we... You should never be totally hands-off yes, or truly hands-off. We yeah. kind of went a little bit too hands-off because we 
we were tired of it and, and we were doing other things and and looking back we shouldn't have so now yeah. now it's again it's about reviewing your system your strategies making sure you get reports and knowing what's happening so although it can be whether it's local whether it's not local you still have to continue to do your due diligence and know what's happening with your property okay. <laughs> perfect 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 so let's take a brief break here a word from my sponsors and when we come back mel i want to talk to you for a minute i want to talk to you about being a woman in a predominantly male dominant field how you navigate that and i know you got you got you got your sidekick right next to you dave can take on anybody, anybody. But let, <laughs> let's kind of talk about that when we come right back it sounds great finding real estate deals can be a challenge but with batch leads it doesn't have to be Batch Leads has created a one-stop solution for all your real estate needs. So you can find more sellers, close more deals, and maximize revenue. Batch Leads offers a comprehensive suite of lead generating tools that cover text messaging, skip tracing, finding comps, and much more. Batch Leads help you simplify, manage, and organize all your data in one place. Batch will help you stack your lists and identify properties that appear on multiple lists and have multiple distress indicators. These sellers are likely to be highly motivated and eager to sell. Get the most powerful and complete lead generation platform in the industry. Locate sellers, buyers, and lenders nationwide in seconds. Go to batchlead.io and use promo code WELOVEEQUITY. All right, guys, we are back with Mel and Dave Dupree based out of Canada, and they are buying tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of apartment complex across North America. So, yes, that's Canada. Yes, that's here within the States also. So what I want to ask you, Mel, is being a woman in this male dominated space, how do you find yourself navigating uh, the industry? Yeah, and it's interesting because when I, a lot of people don't know that about us, but when I first met Dave, I had two properties already and he had the one. So it's, it's always something that I, that I loved. And I think I just, I didn't make it an excuse. I, I wanted to buy a property that had a very strong why. My kids are my why. And it just kept me driven. So for me, it's really, it was really identifying why do I want to do this? Why do I want to keep growing my portfolio? Why do I want to keep expanding? And it was in order to provide, in order to quit my job in my 30s. That was one reason I w wanted so I could spend more time with them. And and that's how I, I kind of did. I just, I would show up to meetings and often be the only woman in, in, in the room or in the conference. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't, I didn't let that stop me. And I still sometimes quite often will go to conferences or whatnot. And, and often I might not be the only one, but I just don't let that stop me. No, so, it, sorry, Marcus, go ahead. So you got to have a strong domineering demeanor, Mel, because you say, you know what? The hell with it. If I'm the only woman there, if I, I handled care. this guy, yes, I have to as well. <laughs> well, and it's true though, Marcus, 100% true, because sometimes people, uh, they'll, they'll kind of just try and address like if we're going together and they think it's my, they think it's my show, right? They think yep. it's my thing. And it's like, whoa, whoa. Mel is out as involved, if not more. Like she knows everything that's going on. Well, it's fine. And Sometimes it's like we'll this go. isn't my thing that she's tagging along. This, this is truly a a, a a couple thing that we do together. And Mel actually introduced me to it. So yeah. you should probably be talking to her more than me. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Sometimes we'll go for lunch or, or for meetings and talk with say lenders about funds. And Dave will do more of the social talk and talking about maybe the property. But then I'm the one that's gonna be like, all right, let's head down at the end here. Are we uh -oh. are we doing this and, and negotiations <laughs> and, and uh <laughs> putting pen to paper? So exactly. Yeah, you wanna know where we can get the money buy, so we can buy. just yeah. buy, 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 buy. <laughs> let's drive it, let's go, let's go. Yeah, yeah, you let let Dave handle all of the fluff talk. I want to yeah. know the numbers. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. <laughs> they don't even see me coming, right? <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. And the reason why I ask that is because, you know, like you say, we go to a lot of these different real estate conferences and things like that. And although, you know, women are really starting to rise up in the industry, it's still a small portion compared to, to the male dominated industry. And I just always like to get a woman's perspective when it comes to, you know, how do you feel navigating, you know, that industry? And, and it seems like you guys got it nailed down. You're the boss, 
and Dave just listens to everything that you do. <laughs> well, Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's just the days, I think. But <laughs> yeah, no, but we both have our lanes, and we know we know where we fall, and, and we, we kind of lie in them. And but again, we're both not be afraid to get into each other's lanes and say, "Hey, I think this," or vice versa. So it's truly a, a great partnership in that sense. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, guys, in the respect for time, because I know you guys have to jump off here in a minute, I want to pass over some of our questions and maybe have you on, you know, once again. But what would you recommend for a new investor getting started? What would you recommend for them to do right now? Yeah, I mean, number one would say, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Find somebody who's been there, somebody that you you feel connected with, somebody who has knowledge. And, and and get the knowledge piece because one mistake in real estate, the reality is with real estate, you can make a lot of money and it's powerful. However, mistakes can be very costly and that's something that we didn't do from the beginning. We did not invest in a mentor right away. If I were to look back, I wish I would have. But now, I mean, we've, we've invested hundreds of thousands throughout the years, yeah. of course, and because it helps with, with our growth. So if you're brand new into real estate investing, find a coach who does exactly what you want to be doing because you're going to get a re the return on investment. There you go. Well said, well said. Those are words of wisdom right there. What trends are you guys looking for in the current market? You know, with the high appreciation, what are you guys really looking for to try and hedge yourselves against, you know, any downturn in the market? And that's where, yeah, no, great question, Marcus. And people ask this all the time. If you're going in so highly leveraged, Aren't you afraid if tomorrow the, the value goes down? And, and what I tell people is, again, it's underwriting the deal properly in the beginning. Let's say, Marcus, I buy, a, well, we are, let's say we buy a property wherever, pick, pick somewhere in the States, we're buying in Florida. So we buy somewhere in Florida, 100% financed, we buy a million dollar property and 100% financed. And we have, let's say, a, a three to five year term with the seller. Well, if on paper, the deal tomorrow, I lose, you know, two hundred thousand dollars of value. It's now worth eight hundred thousand dollars on paper. My rents are still coming in. I still made sure to underwrite that asset. So it's just making sure in the beginning you pick the right asset and that you have a long enough term. If that was a six month term, I might be in trouble to pay that person back. But if it's a two, three, five year term for my exit strategy in order to pay back those investors and lenders, I know that yes, the market does this, but it always kind of does this, right? So in a three year point. Even though I'm, I'm highly leveraged, the asset will have stabilized and returned to market value, if not hired at that point, and that's how I'll exit it. So we, the market trend, the market, the market is what it is. It's just that when you get into an asset, you have to understand that there's contingencies and that things happen. And you have to, you have to buy the right asset in the beginning, especially when you're using other people's money. Yep. Perfect. 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 Well said. Well said. So guys, let's put you on a hot seat. We're going to put... <laughs> Mel and Dave on the hot seat. So, Mel and Dave on the hot seat. Why? On the hot seat. Let's get ready. Let's get you're, ready. You're used to those trucks. You're used to those trucks, <laughs> right? Get out of the way. Mer, mer. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Uh, starting over, what would you guys do differently? I know, Mel, you, you spoke about it uh, briefly. You said you would have hired a mentor earlier. What about you, Dave? Starting over, what would you do differently? Starting over, I would not listen to people that aren't where I want to be or aren't doing what I want to do. Uh, again, I was in rocket science. I was a firefighter, right? It, anyone can do anything. So I would not listen to people. I would only take advice from people that are doing what I want to do. And I would shut everyone else out and not listen to their opinions. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Next question. What is one characteristic you believe every high producing investor should have? Ooh. I, I would say sales. And I don't mean sales and in, as in a cheesy salesperson, but I mean, you need to be able to speak with people and not being afraid to to ask and not being afraid to explain the benefits. So, so the, the sales are more that this personality to, to, to move forward and, and ask for it. I would say emotional intelligence. Okay. Well, that's okay. basically what I meant. You just said it better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. What is one motivational quote that has stuck with you during those down times? You know, to keep you going forward, persevering and getting through all of the mud and the muck and the mire. Idea one? Successful. Go ahead. No, here you go. <laughs> uh, well, I know, I know I thought you were going to say that one. I, I like, there's so many different things. I love listening to David Goggins. Uh, he pumps me up. He inspires me. I probably can't say his quotes here. But anyway, if, you, if you're a Goggins fan, you know what I'm talking about. But something else is Albert Einstein, right? The What's that quote again? It's the, 
the mindset you can't solve a problem with the same mindset that got you there. And, and to me, that was like mind blowing again, you, which what we end up saying is you can't become a real estate investor with that consumer mindset, right? Yeah. So and I'm, I'm probably butchering how Einstein said it, but it's something to that effect, Marcus. And I love it because it's so true. Yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go back a little cheesy maybe, but the, the good old Walt Disney quote, if you can dream it, you can make it happen. And I have it on my board outside the office, but it's so true because I remember when I first met Dave, I had told him, I'm going to buy 10 properties before I'm 40. And everybody else that I told would say, you can't, yeah. you're not going to do that. You're not going to be able to make it happen and whatnot. But I just knew that I could. And by the time I turned 40, I think we had 27 Seven, buildings yeah, yeah. back wow. then. So dreaming it and, and knowing that I'm, I might not know fully how I'm going to get there yet, but just believing that you can do it is so powerful. Wow. Wow. Absolutely marvelous, guys. Absolutely great. Thank you so much. Guys. Really, really, really inspired me and inspired others, I'm sure, because, you know, I have some goals and I'm like, okay, I'm getting close to that threshold where these goals are supposed to become uh, reality. So thank you so much for inspiring me personally. So tell me, guys, you guys work with plenty of students. You guys do some coaching and everything like that. Tell us about your platform. Tell us about what you're doing because I'm not, not only want to inspire people, but I want them to be able to get the right resources from the right people so they can move in the right direction. Yeah, we have a large um, action family mentoring program where we teach people how to buy properties using none of their own money and without joint venture partners and the combination of, of videos and access Dave and I and a huge network and our Rolodex essentially on, so they can build their, their own, own portfolio. It's a lifetime access program as well but if anybody's interested they can just reach out to us through social media we're all over we're on tiktok we're on instagram on youtube on facebook and our handle is always investor mail dave okay so you guys know exactly where to go to get the information and then they do have a free creative finance and master class so go to www.3secretstrategies.com is that correct that's correct. Right. And it's the number three. So don't, don't spell it out. So three secret strategies.com. Correct. There yeah. And, go. and it's, it's going to be good for those who are very visual. I know it's I'm a visual. Analyzing board, uh, We're whiteboard. on the whiteboard drawing it out for you. So if you want to see some numbers attached to everything we spoke to you today, you'll be able to see it. Okay. Okay. And then I'm going to end with this. All I do is win, win, win. Because no that's what you guys win, are doing. <laughs> you guys are winning. Keep oh. it up. Keep uh, going. Okay. Like I said, you guys inspired me. So again, Give us your social media handle so people can know exactly where to go to find you. Yes, it's always Investor Mel Dave. All right, you guys know what to do. Go to Investor Mel Dave, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, even YouTube. Go and get the information from them. And I want you to win. And I want you to always move at the speed of instructions, as one of my close friends would say. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Family, go out there and take action. Awesome. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. All right, guys, that was a fun interview. I really love Mel and Dave. They were so easy to talk to. And not only that, they have a lot of information to offer you and to give you. So uh, you heard their social media handles. Get out there. Take the opportunity. They're doing this again with no money out of their pocket. So if you have the excuse of, well, I can't do it because I have bad credit or um, I don't have money in the bank. I'm not making six figures. Eliminate those excuses. Get out there. Start branding yourself. Start pe telling people what you want to do. Start investing in yourself. Don't look at mentorship as something being paid, but look at it as an investment. Get out of that consumer mentality that Dave spoke about and start getting into that that investor mentality. That way you can become a producer versus a consumer. So it's Marcus Maloney, guys. You know what to do. You can always find me at MRCS Maloney. That's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, MRCS Maloney. Come on, join the family. If you're listening to this show, because you are, if you're on YouTube or if you're listening to it on iTunes, iCloud or something like that, make sure you subscribe. I like to bring on a diverse population of people. So it's not just fix and flipping. It's not just wholesaling, but it's apartments. It's how to raise private capital, all of those kind of things. So, and then if there's a topic that I haven't touched, like Airbnbs, make sure you reach out to me. Let me know what you want to hear. I can bring on the best guest in order to talk to you about that. So get out there, 
get the information that you need and always, always, always remember to enjoy the journey. Thank you for listening to today's show. I picked up some great actionable items and I'm sure you did as well. If so, let me know. You can always reach me via social media at facebook.com slash MRCS Maloney, Twitter at MRCS Maloney, and of course, IG at MRCS Maloney. You can also always reach me via email at mmaloney at equityri.com. Make sure you reach out to our guest as well. You can always find their contact information in the show notes below. If you have not subscribed already, what are you waiting for? Join the family. And while you're at it, leave us a five-star review. This is how we tell if we're providing you with what you need for your journey. If there's someone you would like for me to interview, or if there's a subject matter you would like for me to cover, please let me know. Finally, if you're looking for additional information about real estate investing, go to equityrealestateblog.com, also youtube.com slash Marcus Maloney. Until next time, family, always enjoy the journey.